Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. I ran across an interesting conversation on Twitter the other day, and this was at Crisis of Conscience, and it's someone who is in IT, and their tweet said, our InfoSec group just sent out an email to everyone who has Wireshark on their system that it's deemed a security risk and will be uninstalled from their computers. And the exact email she wrote in there was, as a product itself, Wireshark is more vulnerable to attacks than most other programs due to literally hundreds of developers programming the code we're addressing the high number of installations that lead to vulnerabilities. And there was quite a number of folks who jumped in on this thread, many of them who were disparaging towards the InfoSec group for deciding that they need to take away this legitimate tool that we use for business purposes. And there's another person that I follow, Frank McGovern, who is the person who heads up Blue Hat Conference, um, the uh, Blue Team Conference in Chicago. And he jumped in and said, hey, I've removed Wireshark before at a company, and you know this is the reason why. And so I thought it would be interesting to have a quick conversation about application allow listing, which essentially is you're only allowing the things that you want to run on a company asset for both security purposes, but also maybe productivity because some of these things may chew up CPU or memory or whatever in disk space. And a lot of folks were upset again about how it was a legitimate tool. And I think, in my opinion, InfoSec should have the right to evaluate an application And if there are a high number of vulnerabilities or CVEs that are out there, and then you look at the install base and it's high, they should have the prerogative to be able to remove that app, but also have an exception process for folks who might actually need it for legitimate business purposes. Because I think a lot of folks today feel like They can install whatever they want. They treat a company asset just like a personal asset, and that's really not the case. Your corporate machine shouldn't be a personal machine, and evaluating applications that have high CVEs or vulnerabilities is a strong security capability. So in my opinion, I don't really have a problem with this. Obviously, I think a lot of the IT folks jumped in, but as an InfoSec, person, I don't have an issue with this as long as it's not preventing someone from legitimately doing their job as part of the organization. IT folks often suffer from the disease of that's for thee, but not for me. And they want to have administrative access to the machine, install whatever they want to install, do whatever they want to do, and not have the same infosec controls as the rest of the organization. And just like we try to articulate with executives and senior leadership that you don't need less security controls, you need more, so too should it be with IT. IT has a tremendous amount of access, a tremendous amount of privilege, and we should be very conscientious about what we allow them to install and do. I also don't have a problem with this, provided there is an exception process. There are are obviously legitimate uses of Wireshark and those should be allowed. However, and I would challenge every listener of this show to this, there is a difference between, oh, I can install that app, I'm gonna install it just in case I need it, versus I have to go to an exception process to use this app, I'm only gonna do that if I really need it. it this will absolutely reduce the install base of the application. Now, if you're not watching on video, you may have missed me rolling my eyes massively as Andy read the email from this person's InfoSec team where they blamed the open source software model as the rationale for restricting this software. 
Andy, I think you made a better argument, which is if Wireshark is in fact subject to many CVEs and is generally more vulnerable than an average application. And to be completely honest, I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, then any InfoSec team doing their job should try to reduce the install base of that application. Open source software is neither a reason for an application to be less secure, nor is it a reason to be more secure. If you go back to one of the very first guests we have on our show, the gal who literally wrote the book on AppSec, Tanya Jenka, she talked about sometimes there's, this, there's a perception that open source software has this magic security fairy that goes around and waves security pixie dust on open source software. By virtue of the code being publicly accessible, it's inherently more secure. And she threw cold water on that because security researchers have mortgages, have bills to pay, need to put roof over their head. They don't get any of those things by walking around and doing security reviews in open source software for no reason. On the other hand, I don't think there's a reason to believe open source software is inherently less secure either. I think it's roughly on par with commercial software for the most part. There can, of course, be exceptions to the rule, but I don't think in and of itself blaming something as being commercial software or open source software is reason alone why not to allow it. I would rather see hard data. This has had this many CVEs reported over the last two years with a vulnerability uh, CVSS of X or higher. And it is too broadly installed in our environment on people who do not have a business reason to use it. Therefore, we're going to try to slim down our install base. That's a message I can get much more behind than this one. So I think their heart was in the right place. I think their messaging was poor. And as we talk about a lot on this show, one of the things we encourage our listeners to do is get really good at communicating, especially when it comes to communicating risk and do a, a better job of putting yourself in other people's shoes and not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And so um, this is a really good discussion and it dovetails nicely into Andy, where you want to take this, which, which is application allow listing or deny list. And Adam and I, we both work for Microsoft, although we don't work in any of the organizations that deem or look at security policies, but we've often talked about how liberal Microsoft is with their machines, especially for us in the field. I still have administrative access on my machines and I can generally install any application that I want. However, there are a few that are blocked and I will give an example. And as soon as I say this, you will know why it is blocked. If I went to my corporate computer and I tried to access team viewer, regardless of if it's in the web or if it's an application, I try to install it. It, immediately gets blocked. Of course, there's reasons for that, right? Like you, there's vulnerabilities in team viewer. There's really no reason for me to have it. I was trying to do it as part of my lab in order to remote into one of my machines. So it was somewhat for learning purposes as part of my job, but because I couldn't use it, I'd use a different way to get that access. And so even, you know, at Microsoft, which, is very, very liberal with our applications and what we can put in. I can install some of the applications that are blocked inherently. And I don't want to go on a deep tangent on why that is, but just briefly to explain it, part of Microsoft's architectural philosophy is that user endpoints should really be isolated from everything else. They shouldn't really talk to each other. They shouldn't really talk directly to servers or any other part of the environment. And it should ultimately, ultimately be to a point where we don't really care that much if an individual endpoint gets compromised. We'll nuke it from orbit, flatten it and reinstall, and everything comes back down from the cloud and we go on with life. At this point, there should be nearly zero data that's stored only locally to the device that's not so, not also in the cloud. And as, again, like a, a field salesperson, Andy, it's not like you have privileged access to pretty much anything. So 
You know, if an attacker compromises your machine, they, they can't do a whole heck of a lot with it. And so um, also that philosophy is over time, reduce the architectural importance of your individual endpoints and get them to be not necessarily dumb terminals, but pretty close to it where they're, they're not particularly interesting in and of them in and of themselves. Okay. Moving on to our next topic. And this was something interesting that you sent Adam to <laughs> our group chat. Mm -hmm. Apple put out a blog that essentially revealed that iMessage, which is their proprietary messaging app and protocol is now moving to what they call post quantum level three, which is a new state of the art quantum secure messaging at scale. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of kind of where iMessage came from and then where it's going, but also we as a podcast, me and Adam did talk about quantum cryptography quantum computing and some of the things all involved in post quantum cryptography and encryption. And those were episodes 99, 100 and 101. So if you wanted to go back and kind of get a basis on what quantum computing was and quantum um, post quantum encryption, and then also NIST, which recently, well, this was about a year or so ago, selected a few stable post quantum uh, encryption algorithms, uh, which we talked about in episode 101. So go back and take a look at those. But iMessage initially launched in 2011, and it was one of the first end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps uh, by default um, that was at scale, being used at scale. In 2019, they switched from RSA to elliptic curve cryptography, and they switched from protecting the keys uh, to on the device with the secure enclave. In our episodes, which we talked about uh, quantum computing, there's an algorithm called Shor's algorithm that was actually based on uh, from this mathematician back in the early 90s that predicted, even before quantum computing was a thing, that quantum computing could theoretically break the mathematics that make modern day cryptography work, which is we have the factor of two large prime, like one is the key and one is um, the message. And so quantum computing has the ability to just factor these primes and do it in a short amount of time versus classical computing, which takes literally like decades or centuries based on the, the large number of, uh, uh, of the factor and so um, one of the attack methods that have, has come up in the InfoSec world is, well, we can't decrypt that information right now based on classical computing. However, quantum computing is starting to get more and more powerful. And at some point, Shor's algorithm will be successfully executed, which would then break classic encryption algorithms. And so why not steal the blob now, the encrypted blob, and just hold it until quantum computing has caught up and then you can decrypt it. So the um, harvest now decrypt later. And so as part of that, post-quantum cryptography has been in development for years. Microsoft has been involved in it as well as well as, you know, number of mathematicians and cryptographers and NIST selected four post quantum encryption algorithms that are stable signal was the first one to launch a post quantum security within their uh, messaging app. So if you are familiar with the end to end encryption uh, encrypted messaging applications, signals, one of the ones that is very popular and it used Crystal's Kyber, which we talked about again in our episode 101 uh, from the NIST selection, um, they use it to secure the initial key establishment, but not the ongoing conversation. So the initial key where you establish that first communication, that is using Crystal's Kyber, which is post-quantum stable 
And that elevates the app from level one to level two. And so in this blog, they talk about level zero through three. Zero is no end-to-end -end encryption. Level one is end-to-end -end encrypted. And then level two, in this case, is that initial key uh, establishment is using post-quantum encryption. Apple now has this level three where not only do they have the post-quantum uh, cryptography for the initial key establishment, but they also have an ongoing rekeying or self-healing in case the key, the key to the conversation gets compromised. And so they're essentially revealing that now they have this level three post-quantum encryption for their messaging app. The blog itself that we're going to link in the show notes, I highly recommend to at least go through it and maybe peruse it. Some of it is pretty high level, even for me, reading through it. I'm not a cryptographer. I understand the exchange of cryptographic keys, but it is pretty detailed. It's really for, there's like reviews that are ongoing for this. But what I found was interesting is from just more of an infosec uh, mindset, we now have a widely used messaging app, one that I use all the time, that is essentially level three beyond what Signal has done for post-quantum cryptography, which makes me think maybe I should start switching all of my communications because I use Signal for a lot of my communications and many of my friends use Apple devices. And if iMessage is kind of the most secure you know, in, in this realm, maybe switching to that messaging app instead. So anyways, it got me thinking, uh, this was something I was unaware of. I didn't even realize that Signal had started using post-quantum cryptography for their initial key establishment, which is great because I do use Signal quite a bit, but iMessage is now even further than that. We have frequently and deservedly so praised Apple as a security vendor on this podcast. Apple does have excellent security chops to the point where if devices have fallen into even well-meaning law enforcement hands, if they don't know the device passcode or pin code, they've been unable to break into it. Short of buying a zero day from, uh, is it NSO security in Israel? Um, and folks like that, or, um, oh gosh, Celebrite. That's the one I'm thinking of, not NSO. Sorry for the mix up. Celebrite, um, buying zero days that they hoard <laughs> to break into devices. So Apple has excellent security chops. I was disappointed when I saw this blog that the byline is something like the Apple security team. So there are no names associated with it in true Apple fashion. Um, that's disappointing. I would like to see Apple allow their brilliant researchers who implement stuff like this to post under their real names and not just attribute it to the work of uh, Apple security team. I think in the long run, it's, it's quite incredible that Apple has maintained such strong security posture despite this policy, because I know really talented researchers and uh, real, this, this term is overused, but actual thought leaders, uh, they want credit for that. Um, and I, I fear someday this could become a drag on Apple's security benefit, just like it possibly has become a, a drag on Apple's art of AI uh, level of innovation, um, given that they don't allow researchers to really share their research or share their names or anything else. So um, as awesome as an announcement as this is, and it's truly great, uh, I do want to see more there from Apple in the future. That said, this is impressive. And if your thought process is, and, and mine has been to this point too, well, quantum is this someday thing. It's almost, we might get there someday, but it's this borderline boogeyman thing that we're all supposed to be scared of. So I was talking about quantum is this thing that has been presented as this potential boogeyman someday, this potential risk someday. And that's mostly how I've thought about it. 
in that it's not something I really need to worry about now. We have enough on our plate for right now, so I'll worry about this some. One really interesting point Apple makes in here is that with how cheap storage has become, nation states in particular, adversarial nation states, are starting to do what you talked about, Andy, where it's harvest now, decrypt later. Just get everything I can get my hands on, we'll figure it out someday. That's frankly terrifying. If it comes to a point in which all current communications can just be, you know, with the snap of a finger decrypted by some future quantum computer and all these conversations or messages or files, we thought were private wind up not being that way. And so Apple's point here is this is actually something we need to worry about now because of the pervasity of this harvest now decrypt later approach. And another thing that's really just incredible here, and you talked about Signal has implemented this, and it's, it's good as long as that key is never compromised. What Apple is doing is deploying this at scale, at scale with the release of all the next major releases, minor releases, sorry, minor releases of all their operating systems. So they even quote, this is coming to iOS 17.4, iPadOS 17.4, macOS 14.4, and watchOS 10.4, which is just incredible that this protocol is CPU efficient enough that it can run on the system on a chip inside an Apple Watch. <laughs> That's also incredible. Um, and so one last note for our listeners that might be from outside the United States, because this comes up all the time. People outside the United States don't understand why iMessage is a big deal. And you've probably seen a lot of explainers on it, and I won't go way off the rails here, but you just need to understand that iMessage is a very big deal in the United States. It is, um, I, iPhone use, are very pervasive in the United States. I'd say most of the adults I interact with, which to be fair, are upper middle class people with pretty well-paying jobs and everything, probably 80% or more of those adults are on iPhone. And we actually, at the younger ages, teenagers, go do a Twitter search for green bubbles and watch how people talk about it. If you have green bubbles, meaning like you're on Android today, you're sending SMS messages or, or will be RCS in the future as iOS adds that support, it's seen like you are <laughs> almost a lesser individual. It's really almost horrifying because there's borderline class warfare going on that you're broke, you're, you're a loser, you're a bum if you use green messages, like if you're on Android. There's a whole social component to it here in the United States that creates almost this, this network of haves versus have-nots. And part of the reason why is group text messaging when you bring someone in who has a green bubble is massively inferior. And it's because of all the limitations with SMS and MMS. And really not Apple's fault other than they hadn't implemented RCS kind of stubbornly. So those will get better. Um, and maybe that will reduce some of the gap. But if you are being dismissive of this and saying, well, it's iMessage, who cares? Nobody uses that here in Europe or, or whatever part of the world you're from. Just understand in the United States, anybody who's middle class on up, uh, I, iPhone and iMessage is pervasive and it is overwhelmingly the way people in the United States communicate through what they would consider text messaging today. So this may not be as relevant in your corner of the world where maybe WhatsApp is more widely used or in China um, where I know other apps are much more popular, but at least in the United States, this is a really, really, really big deal. So um, I just like to throw that out there because sometimes it's easy to go, well, who cares? Like nobody uses iMessage. And if, if you're sitting in Denmark or the United Kingdom, you may think that's the case, but it's it's very different here in that sense. Yeah, it was really interesting to see because they list some of the messaging apps under their level zeros through level three. And so under level zero, QQ, which I don't even know who uses that anymore, Skype, Telegram, and WeChat. And Telegram and WeChat are ones that are definitely used a lot. Those are all level zero. No end-to-end -end encryption. WeChat's the one that's popular in China. Correct. That's one I would and then end-to-end -end encrypted by default. Line, which I know that I have family in Taiwan that uses it quite a bit. It's also used a lot in Japan. 
Viber, another one that's also used quite a bit in Asia. WhatsApp, which is used all over the place. It's probably one of the most widely used apps globally. Uh, Signal and iMessage previously, those were all end-to-end encrypted by default or at level one. And now Signal is the only one at level two with the PQC or the post-quantum uh, cryptography establishment for the key. And then iMessage is the only one at level three. And so I think very importantly, you mentioned it, Adam, this is going to just get rolled out by default. Nothing you have to do, which is great. It's just going to happen. And I think one of the things you need to think about from an organization, obviously, like you're probably not going to switch to iMessage as your primary default messaging app. However, we have often talked about disaster recovery and IR. And when something happens to your company messaging platform or email during an incident, you need to have a backup way of communicating. Maybe you need to be able to send passwords back and forth and usernames because you can't do it within Teams or within Slack or whatever you're using because it's compromised. Well, guess what? Now you have a level three post-quantum secure messaging app by default. So maybe you think about using iPhones and iMessage as your backup, you know, as your company devices that, that you're issuing out. And that is your backup message. It must be an iMessage or something like that. So something to think about because we do need a secure way to send things during an incident. And so that I think this would be a, a valid backup plan um, if you needed to communicate during something like that. Couple final notes here. Um, Annie, all great points there. Keep in mind that unless you have Apple's advanced data protection turned on, Apple still holds the encryption keys for your iMessages in the cloud if you have that turned on, and you probably do. So you can either turn iMessages in the cloud off, or you can turn on advanced data protection, either of which will prevent Apple from, or you know, law enforcement with a valid uh, uh, subpoena um, from accessing all of your messages, even though they have post-quantum encryption in in motion um, as they're transmitted between devices. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind here. The other thing I think that's really relevant, and we both have touched on how Apple's going to do this at scale and roll this out to literally billions of messages sent here within the next six months. Um, the The other thing to think about and this is going to be maybe the more interesting story for our listeners to follow is does this create a push to get everything moved over to post quantum computing resistant encryption modules and encryption methods? I think um, we can't understate the risk, but we can't overstate the risk either of this harvest now decrypt later kind of approach. And especially for highly sensitive situations, um, they're going to want to implement this as fast as they can. And so if Apple's out there implementing at scale in production in the year 2024, there starts to become the question of what's the excuse for everybody else to lag too far behind. So hopefully we start to see broad deployment of this very quickly across our industry. That would be awesome. And Sometimes it's so easy to get in the weeds on these conversations. I just want to zoom out a second and just say how incredible it is that we can create encryption protocols that run on classic computers but re resist decryption on theoretical quantum computers. And not only can it run on classic computers, as I pointed out, it literally will run on watch OS on the system on a chip inside an Apple Watch. To the cryptographers, the mathematicians, the computer scientists who have brought this to our world, thank you. Thank you. What incredible work this is. What incredible, true innovation and pushing the state of the art in computer science forward and information security forward. Thank you for what you've done because this is truly a watershed, incredible moment and the most incredible part of it is unless this winds up being disastrous, which I'm going to give Apple the benefit of the doubt, I think it will be pretty smooth. Um, this is going to get rolled out to literally hundreds of millions of people 
and be imperceptible. And that is maybe the greatest win of all. So just really cool stuff. I had to geek out for a moment and just talk about how cool this really is and what amazing innovation it is. And it'll be exciting to see it come and trickle down across our entire industry in short order. Yeah, that advanced data protection, it's interesting that you mentioned that because literally after I wrote the show notes, I remembered our episode where we talked about the advanced data protection, which turns on end-to-end encryption for those of you who might not have listened to the show and might not know what it is. It's a setting within your iCloud. It turns on end-to-end encryption for all the other things that have not been end-to-end encrypted before, like your iCloud backups and your calendars and your contacts and all of that. So it it literally turns on end-to-end encryption for everything. It's a pretty easy process, but it'll evaluate where you're signed in to Apple everywhere. It'll make sure that you're up to date. And there's a key that if you lose it, okay, guess what? You just lost basically everything. So, you know, there's some risk to it. Uh, For those of you who are paranoid like me, um, I went ahead and just turned it right back on. I had turned it off for some reason. I can't remember why, but I turned it back on. And wasn't it because you tried beeper for like five minutes and you're like, forget it. <laughs> that's right. It was because I tried beeper. Speaking which, of which, this probably uh, puts the final nail in that coffin um, as yeah. well. Uh, and and will lock out all of those. Uh, anybody trying to access the iMessage protocol, which I suspected they were doing through old protocols in the first place, but this will most certainly um, push them out moving forward. Yep. All right. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes as well as the links that we used to talk about. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, please reach out. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.